significant reason. The urgent necessity to get money to send her invalid father to a warmer climate. That Vicky had tricked Christopher Kentoni into marrying her. Nevertheless, she had tricked him. And when Christopher found out soon after the marriage, he was not unnaturally furious and disgusted with her. As luck would have it, Vicky had by this point fallen genuinely in love with her husband. But what could she do in the face of his suspicion and the added complications of a glamorous opera singer with whom Christopher had always been infatuated and who now declared her intention of once more taking the first place in his life. Wife to Christopher, 1936. <sighs> what do you think? I think that sounds marvellous. Well, there's plenty more where that came from. Except my love. 1937, but not for me, 1938. After office hours, <laughs> 1939. Came into a moment, 1940. Strangers may marry, 1941. Love made the choice, 1942. Dare I be happy, 1943. Take me with you. 1944, meant for each other, 1945. Good evening, my name is Sarah. And I am Natalie. There is a blue commemorative plaque around the corner from where I live and it inspires me every day and I would like to share the reason why. I'm not originally from the North and I'd never heard of these two sisters and I just think they're brilliant and I'd love to share their story with you. We are proud. Proud of who we are. And proud of those who came before us. And we would like to welcome you to the heroines of the Holocaust. 2020 was quite the year, wasn't it? Wasn't it just? But today we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on something else. Something uplifting. Something inspiring. Something amazing. We are going to shine a light on two remarkable individuals. Two remarkable women. <laughs> Indeed. Two remarkable women from the region. Sunderland, to be exact. So, where to begin? We could start at the beginning. We could, but... But... Shall we take the scenic route instead? Good idea. This is the story of two sisters, Ida and Louise Cook, a couple of ordinary lasses that achieved extraordinary things and who chose to undertake an extraordinary Scarlet Pimpernel female James Bond type of adventure. But we'll get to that. <laughs> Under the name of Mary Birchall, Ida Cook wrote romance novels for Mills and Boone, some of which you heard at the start of the show. All in all, she wrote 112 novels, which in itself is a pretty remarkable achievement. But together, she and her sister would go on to do something even more amazing. In private, they were undertaking risky missions to help rescue trapped Jewish families in pre-war Austria and Germany. The sisters were born in Sunderland, County Durham. Louise in 1901. Ida in 1904. They both attended the Duchess School in Annick. And although their father was posted to Wandsworth in 1919, the girls never lost touch with their friends in the North. <laughs> On leaving school, both took civil service jobs in London. <laughs> Louise was a clerical assistant at the Board of Education. And Ida was a copy typist. <laughs> we were both earning less than three pound a week. The pair of us soon developed a passion for the opera. Oh, I just happened to hear some Puccini one day. And well, after that, we couldn't get enough. In 1923, we decided to treat ourselves. And so we bought a gramophone <laughs> on the higher purchase mind. It was wonderful. The two of us would sit together and listen to it endlessly. We particularly loved listening to the voice of Amelie and Gally Kirchie. Oh, I can hear it now. Ha, ha, ha. 
but a good romantic novel is a heartwarming thing which strikes a responsive chord in those who are happy and offers a certain lifting of the spirits to those who are not. <laughs> she was brilliant at it. Oh, I loved it. And I was soon earning a thousand pound a year. Sorry. <laughs> that same year, we made our first visit to the Salzburg Music Festival. And it was there we met with Frau Mattia Meyer. She was a Jewish musicologist who explained to us the plight of the Jews under Hitler. In 1935, the Nazis enacted the Nuremberg Laws, which deprived all Jews of their rights as citizens. I can't emphasise sufficiently how we stumbled into this thing, but stumble into it we did. But like my mum always used to say, you are what you do. And once we'd had our eyes open to the appalling situation that Jewish people in Germany found themselves in, we couldn't just stand by and do nothing. They were without any rights as human beings at all. We had to act. We decided to use the guarantee visa system to save as many Jews as we could. You see, under that system, the Nazi authorities allowed the departure of Jews to Britain. Aye, so long as they had a guarantee of financial support there. And so, in order to help the Jews escape the Nazi regime, we visited Germany on multiple occasions, each time using our genuine love of the opera as a cover for our frequent travel. I made sure to learn German so as to better deal with the refugees and the German authorities. Couldn't act. And I set about writing as many books as I could. Well, for three or four a year. It was now a matter of life or death. When returning to England, we smuggled valuables, such as jewellery, which allowed the Jews fleeing Germany to satisfy the British financial security requirements for immigration. You see, reselling these valuable items gave the refugees a source of income in England, which made it easier to get the guarantors required. We had our cover story all ready. We simply said that we were two nervous British spinsters who didn't trust our families at home. And so, when we went abroad, we took all our jewellery with us. Well. There's no answer for that. You can say, how ridiculous. But you can't say, that's not true. Yeah, I remember once adorning me plain jumper with a huge string of diamonds. Someone's entire capital, which I had to pass off as just fake paste from Woolies. <laughs> and our earrings had to be clip-on ones, as neither of us had pierced ears. That was the kind of thing officials noticed. We worked with Austrian conductor Clemens Krauss and his wife, the soprano Viarika Ursulia, who initially told us of the persecution of the Jews. And even though our British passports offered us sun protection, we were still often in real danger. If we had been caught and made to talk, we could have almost certainly been arrested. We stayed at the Adlon Hotel in Berlin, which was a favourite haunt of senior Nazi officers. But no one suspected a thing. We were just mistaken for admiring fools. <laughs> <laughs> that was how we knew them all by sight, Ida and I. Gurin. Goebbels, Himmler, Stryker, Ribbentrop. We even knew Hitler from the back. Back in England, we bought a flat in Dolphin Square, Pimlico, which we offered out to the Jewish immigrants, rather than us living in it ourselves. And I gave talks all around the country, encouraging people to act as guarantors. We even spent so much of our own finances on these rescue missions, that I fell into about £8,000 worth of debt. That'd be the equivalent of £300,000 in today's money. Ah, oh, but that didn't matter. Our parents always told us to know the difference between right and wrong. And what was happening was most definitely wrong. We couldn't just stand by. 
We did it because it was the right thing to do. Nothing more, nothing less. And I think we made a difference. Just goes to show what two ordinary lasses can achieve, eh? described as being resourceful, cheerful optimists, aided the escape of 29 people, including Lisa Bash, daughter of German-Austrian intellectuals, who said that the sisters has most certainly saved her from the gas chamber. So let's just take a moment to appreciate that Ida and Louise Cook, two women from the Northeast, Save the lives of 29 individuals. That's 29 strangers. That they rescued from persecution. After the war, their refugee work continued with the Adoption Committee for Aid to Displaced Persons. Ida continued writing throughout the rest of her life and would become the president of the Romantic Novelist Association from 1965 until her death in 1986. But the writing that was considered Ida's masterpiece was not, in fact, a piece of romantic fiction, but instead her autobiography, first published in 1950 as We Followed Our Stars, and later reissued in 1980 as Safe Passage. It's still in print and widely read to this day. The girls remained passionate about the opera and so continued to travel until old age defeated them. In 2010, they were posthumously named a British hero of the Holocaust by the British government. So, if you ever find yourself in Sunderland, make sure you pay a visit to the site of their childhood home because in 2017, the Sunderland Council erected a blue plaque commemorating their amazing legacy, which reads, Ida Cook, 1904 to 1986, and her sister, Louise Cook, 1901 to 1991. Residents of 37 Croft Avenue, Sunderland, saved many Jews from persecution. In 1965, they were honoured as righteous among nations by the State of Israel. These seemingly ordinary women were in fact anything but ordinary. They were remarkable. Two sisters, 29 lives saved, and one gramophone. Bought on hire purchase, mind. <laughs> 